One of the challenges of the Reformation Conference is having to do repeated introductions of the speaker. <laughs> and the first one is usually the more formal one. The second one is the more funny one, but the, the one on Sunday morning is a little bit different flavor and direction. So I would just say two things uh, about Dr. David Noe. Uh, in addition to being an author and a scholar and a historian, he is also a minister of the Orthodox Presbyterian Church. When I first met David, he was a ruling elder and he was serving on the Candidates and Credentials Committee of his presbytery. He was actually the chairman of that committee. And he went through the licensure and ordination process and was ordained as a minister, a teacher of the word, I believe. And he has been laboring alongside of another pastor at Reformation OPC in Grand Rapids, Michigan. This is a church that they uh, struggled and labored to plant. Uh, it has been going for several years now, and from everything he says, it seems that the Lord's blessing is upon it, but he continues in that role. And so it's very good to have uh, a minister of the word preaching the word to the people of God. The other thing I would just say is that David is a friend. And as we've worked together on our committee for the historian, as we've interacted on various topics, I have found him to be a most uh, charming and winsome friend, uh, a real man of God who really uh, knows how to extend and to respond to friendship. And that's not always the case among ministers. Sometimes ministers have this little turf thing going on and they protect their own turf. And I just find that with David, that's not ever been the case. And I am delighted to count him as a friend. So David, come and bring God's word to us. Brothers and sisters in Christ Jesus, I ask you to turn with me in your Bibles, please, to Psalm chapter 36, which is on page 571 <clears throat> of your pew Bible. <clears throat> Before we give our attention to uh, the reading and then the proclamation of God's holy word, I ask you to join me in a prayer for the illumination of the Holy Spirit. So I'll be praying before reading these passages and then preaching on the first one, which is Psalm 36. Please join me in prayer. Almighty God and Heavenly Father, we come before you this morning and we give you heartfelt thanks and gratitude for your great kindness and mercy to us. You do not treat us as our sins deserve. You do not treat us with the harsh judgment and condemnation that we have richly earned. Even in our first fall and plunge into sin, when with our first parents, Adam and Eve, we stood in the garden and rejected your law and your commandments, you did not leave us in that condition, but you came seeking after us in the garden in the cool of the evening. You called out our name. You clothed our shame with your righteousness. You gave us the sure promise that the seed of the woman would come and crush the serpent's head, that there would be put an end to death and enmity that we had earned, and that this would come through the suffering of the seed of the woman. We thank you, Heavenly Father, that those promises made there so long ago were kept first to the patriarchs and prophets, and then eventually they were fulfilled in the birth of your Son, Christ Jesus. How we thank you for his life, his perfections, and his obedience. And we thank you that what we had earned in our unrighteousness, he took upon himself, and what he had earned by his righteousness, he gave to us. We thank you, Lord, that when he ascended on high and led captives in his train, that along with you he sent to us the promised Holy Spirit, 
to guide us into all truth. We thank you, Heavenly Father, that your Holy Spirit has caused chosen men who were inspired by that Spirit to write down the things that you had revealed to them in visions and dreams and in all different kinds of manners so that we might have your word. And we thank you that you have preserved it all these years against the assaults of the devil, the world, and even our own flesh, which is so reluctant and disinclined to listen to your word, so filled with foolishness. And so we ask, Heavenly Father, that in this brief time, as we examine your holy word, as we hear the words of Psalm 36 read, and also the beautiful song from Luke chapter 1, that you would give us open ears and open hearts, that your word would go into our ears, that you would, for a time, at least protect us from the many distractions and uh, petty pleasures that fill our lives and minds, our plans and our grievances and everything that we give our hearts to. But instead, you would cause us to give our attention to your holy word and that it, as it goes into our ears and down to our hearts, it may find fertile soil. You would protect it from the assaults of the devil and the cares of this life and you would cause it to grow and take root there. And as it is watered by the ordinary means of grace each week as we receive the word and prayer and sacrament, that you would cause that seed to grow and it would become large and fruitful and you would give us uh, a harvest of 30, 60, or even a hundredfold. And we ask, Heavenly Father, that in this process of sanctification, which is the work of your free grace, you would give us great patience as we have not made ourselves uh, wicked in an instant so you have in your good will decided to make us holy, uh, to sanctify us over the course of our lives. So please give us patience as we wait for the fruits of the Holy Spirit to become mature in our lives. We ask these things in Christ's name. Amen. <clears throat> First then, brothers and sisters, Psalm 36. <clears throat> and as I read God's holy word in your hearing, I urge you to listen with reverent care because it is the infallible and inerrant word of God. For the choir director, a psalm of David, the servant of the Lord. Transgression speaks to the ungodly within his heart. There is no fear of God before his eyes, for it flatters him in his own eyes concerning the discovery of this iniquity and the hatred of it. The words of his mouth are wickedness and deceit. He has ceased to be wise and to do good. He plans wickedness upon his bed. He sets himself on a path that is not good. He does not despise evil. Your loving kindness, O Lord, extends to the heavens. Your faithfulness reaches to the skies. Your righteousness is like the mountains of God. Your judgments are like a great deep. O Lord, you preserve man and beast. How precious is your loving kindness, O God. And the children of men take refuge in the shadow of your wings. They drink their fill of the abundance of your house, and you give them to drink of the river of your delights. For with you is the fountain of life. In your light we see light. O oh, continue your loving kindness to those who know you and your righteousness to the upright in heart. Let not the foot of pride come upon me, and let not the hand of the wicked drive me away. There the doers of iniquity have fallen. They have been thrust down and cannot rise." And then turn with me also, please, if you will, to Luke chapter 1, where I will read verses 46 through 55. <clears throat> and you may wonder why I would choose this passage for a Reformation uh, Day celebration, occasion of the Lord's Day worship. It is because uh, John Calvin says of this passage that when the angel came to Mary, and said, Greetings, Mary, blessed are you. That, that is the clearest picture of the gospel because Mary, the mother of our Lord, was receiving from God himself unmerited favor and grace that she would receive from uh, God so much mercy and kindness and this high privilege uh, to be the mother of our Lord. So again, this is the word of God. Please listen with reverent care. And Mary said, My soul exalts the Lord, and my spirit has rejoiced in God my Savior. For he has had regard for the humble state of his bond slave. For behold, from this time on all generations will count me blessed. For the Mighty One has done great things for me, and holy is his name. 
and his mercy is upon generation after generation toward those who fear him. He has done mighty deeds with his arm. He has scattered those who were proud in the thoughts of their heart. He has brought down rulers from their thrones and has exalted those who were humble. He has filled the hungry with good things and has sent away the rich empty-handed. He has given help to Israel, his servant, in remembrance of his mercy, as he spoke to our fathers, to Abraham and his descendants forever. This ends the reading of God's word. May he bless it to our consideration. This morning the grass withers and the flowers of the field fade away. But this is the word of the Lord, and it will stand firm forever. Beloved in Christ Jesus, as we turn our attention this morning to Psalm 36, there will be two questions. <clears throat> there will be two questions that we will want to ask of this passage and of ourselves as by God's grace we consider what the Holy Spirit has given to us in this text, we will want to know, first of all, what does the Holy Spirit want us to learn from this passage? What does the Holy Spirit want us to learn? What lessons has the Holy Spirit, by God's grace, placed into this passage for us to consider and to contemplate? What is it that the Holy Spirit wants us to learn, to believe from this passage? And then secondarily, what is it that the Holy Spirit would like us to do from this passage? What is it that the Holy Spirit would like us to do as a result of reading and understanding this passage? And this question is important because we do not want to be like the man that James describes in his letter, who looks into the Word of God as a mirror of our behavior and character, who looks into the Word of God and then turns away and immediately forgets what he looks like. That is, we do, not, we do not want to be the kind of person who is a hearer of the word only, but is instead also, by his grace, a doer of the word. And so then these are the two questions that we are going to look at this morning as we examine Psalm 36. What does the Holy Spirit want us to learn? And what does the Holy Spirit want us to do? Now, if you look in uh, your bulletins, you'll see that the title that I gave to this sermon uh, is Your Steadfast Love, and that is because I uh, was negligent and I didn't know that uh, you all use the New American Standard Bible uh, as your Bible for um, <clears throat> worship. And so if the title of the sermon is something that is important to you, then you'll want to retitle it as uh, <clears throat> Your Loving Kindness, O Lord. As you can see, the title is simply taken from the beginning of verse 5, Your Loving Kindness, O Lord. But I hope that the title of the sermon is not too important to you. <clears throat> As we look together at this psalm this morning, beloved, you will see that it divides itself nicely into three separate sections. The first section is verses 1 through 4. The first section is verses 1 through 4, and in these verses, the psalmist describes the character and the nature of the wicked man, those whom he calls in verse 1, the ungodly. In verses 1 through 4, he describes in great detail, in uh, tremendous and in some ways disturbing detail, the nature of the ungodly and what their transgression is like. And that is verses 1 through 4. And then in verses 5 through 9, the psalmist describes the character of our saving God. In verses 5 through 9, the psalmist describes the character of our saving God, how he is the source of all of our righteousness, of all of our faithfulness, of all of our joy, and of all of our blessing. And then in the final three verses, uh, 10, 11, and 12, the psalmist prays that God's loving kindness would continue to the children on whom he has placed his love. And he also ends the psalm with a sober warning, a very sober warning to the ungodly and those who work iniquity. So what we are going to do this morning, by God's grace in the short time we have, is look at th these three sections in order. Again, verses 1 through 4, verses 5 through 9, and verses 10 through 12, to see what the Holy Spirit wants us to learn and what he would like us to do. 
The psalm begins with these words. Transgression speaks to the ungodly within his heart. There is no fear of God before his eyes. The psalmist gives us a picture here of a person who is so mired in his sin, so mired in his sin, that he hears the voice of transgression whispering within his heart. He hears the voice of transgression whispering within his heart. Now, we know, brothers and sisters, that uh, God has inscribed his holy law upon our hearts as well. You know from Romans chapter 2, where Paul says that even those who did not have the law of Moses, the Ten Commandments that I see displayed around the sanctuary, even those to whom the Ten Commandments were not given, the Mosaic law, they had a law inscribed upon their heart. Paul tells us in Romans 2 that this law tells them the difference between right and wrong. And sometimes this law excuses and sometimes this law accuses them. And sometimes we call this law written on the heart, and we call it the voice of conscience. We call it the voice of conscience, and that is an apt description of the sense that all people have of the law of God written on their hearts. And John Chrysostom tells us about this law, this conscience, that no matter how many times we ignore it, no matter how many times we disregard what it is telling us, it never stops whispering to us, the difference between right and wrong, because God has inscribed that law upon our hearts. And so you know the familiar feeling when you are tempted to do something wrong. You know in your heart that it is wrong for you to do this thing. I speak from personal experience and the experience of all of you as well, I trust. You know clear well that engaging in this particular activity, entertaining this thought, speaking this word, doing this action is something that is displeasing to God because God has inscribed his law even on our very hearts. It is engraved there. No matter how many times you ignore it or violate it, you cannot get rid of it completely. It is always there. It is like a judge, Chrysostom says, whose verdict we ignore but who never stops speaking to us and telling us this is right and this is wrong. In this verse, the psalmist is talking about a man, though, who has become so hardened in his sin that it is almost as though he has erased uh, that law. It is almost as though he has silenced that voice of conscience completely, which is no easy thing to do. It is no easy thing to do. And so instead of hearing the voice of right and wrong, which cannot be completely expunged from the human heart, the ungodly man hears transgression speaking within him, whispering to him within his heart. That is what the ungodly man hears, tempting him to wrong, uh, soothing him for wrongs committed, uh, giving him ideas and suggestions, uh, imaginative ways to violate God's law and to uh, engage in even more sin. And the reason for this is given in the second half of verse 1. The reason is that there is no fear of God before his eyes. Now, how is it proper for us to fear God? What is the way that God ought to be feared? You know, the scriptures speak very often of the fear of the Lord. In the Proverbs, it calls uh, the fear of the Lord the beginning of wisdom, the beginning of knowledge. So in what way is it proper for us to fear the Lord? Well, you see, dear Christian, the fear that believers offer to God is very different than the fear that unbelievers offer to God. Unbelievers, when they see the scowling countenance of heaven, they know that judgment is coming for their misdeeds. Because once again, the conscience cannot be completely silenced. It can't be completely expunged. And so when they think for a moment perhaps even just a moment, about the presence of a divine creator and judge, they are filled with a certain kind of fear. The reformers liked to use examples from history. They would like to say things uh, along the lines of the emperor Caligula, who famously was very godless in his behavior, according to the Roman historians. They tell us that when Caligula would hear a leaf fall, even just something as gentle and light as a leaf that would fall in the room where he was sitting, he would be filled with immediate dread and he would hide underneath his bed because he thought that perhaps Jupiter was about to strike him dead for his great wickedness. 
unbelievers have when they think about God as a creator and judge. They have a kind of fear that leads to dread. Punishment is coming. Punishment is coming. Now we as believers have a different kind of fear. It's a fear that's perfect and uh, it is a fear that is akin to love. Because as John tells us, perfect love casts out fear. And so this is a different kind of fear. It's reverence and an awe that God who is all righteousness would condescend to stoop down to visit us with his mercy and his love and kindness and call us his children by adoption so that we would be his once again, though we do not deserve it. And so the psalmist says that for the transgressor and the ungodly, there is no kind of this sort of fear of God before his eyes. He has expunged all proper reverence for the creator God, and if there is any fear at all, it is only that fear of judgment. And then in verse 2, the psalmist says, For it flatters him in his own eyes concerning the discovery of his iniquity and the hatred of it. Transgression, you see, is being personified, which means it's being treated like a person. Transgression or iniquity or sinfulness is being treated by the psalmist in a poetic device like a person who is talking to the ungodly man. And what does transgression say to the ungodly man when he hears its voice within his heart? It flatters him. It smooths over, as the Hebrew word says, it smooths over his actions and his character. It tells him that the things he has done are not really so wrong. It tells him that lying and being cruel and impatient and dishonoring parents and stealing and all these kinds of things and lust and the other terrible things that stalk our hearts, that these are not really so offensive in the eyes of a just and righteous God. The voice of transgression speaks in the ungodly man's heart and it flatters him concerning the discovery of his iniquity and the hatred of it. You notice these two things. Transgression says to the ungodly, what you have done will never be found out. What you have done will never be found out. There will be no discovery or iniquity. Why is it, brothers and sisters, that there are so many civil laws? Why is it that there are so many civil laws? Why is it that there are so many civil laws uh, posted in so many different places? Is it because these uh, civil laws uh, unrighteousness or law-breaking? Uh, do civil laws have the power to stop people from violating the laws of a given state like Wisconsin or uh, maybe, is there something wrong with my microphone here? Okay. The laws of some state like Wisconsin or, you know, Illinois or something like that. No, there are so many civil laws, not because anybody believes that simply passing laws will make others into law-abiding persons, but there are so many civil laws as a kind of deterrence to make it more difficult, more costly, more frightening for people to break the law, and that is uh, in hopes that there will be more peace and order among the citizens of a given area. And so the ungodly man has come to believe that there is no deterrence, there is no consequence for what he is about to do. Uh, if you're driving down the highway and you're you know, driving at 55 or something, you might be tempted to allow your speed to creep up to 60 or 65, something like that, unless you see a posted sign which tells you, actually, the speed limit here is 45. You'd better slow down significantly. The purpose of that sign is to tell you there is a standard of right and wrong, and you best not break it because there could be a consequence. It doesn't succeed in making people law-abiding, but it is a deterrent. Similarly, when you come to believe that there is no consequence for your actions whatsoever, then there is no restraint on law-breaking. There's no restraint on wickedness and unrighteousness. And look at the picture of the ungodly man as uh, we are told, as David tells us in verse 2. It flatters him in his own eyes concerning the discovery of his iniquity and the hatred of it. It tells him, your wrongdoing will never be found out. It will never be exposed and brought to light. What a dangerous position that man is in when he comes to believe that he can commit sin with impunity and he will not actually be punished. 
But there is a second part of it as well in the end of verse 2, not simply concerning the discovery of his iniquity, but also the hatred of it. Uh, Calvin tells us that not all punishment, not all wrongdoing, excuse me, is punished in this life. Not all wrongdoing is punished in this life. And why is that? It's so that the wicked would know God has reserved some of it for the next life. But some wrongdoing is punished in this life. And why is that? Well, Calvin says, and I think he's right about this, it's to let us know that there is a God and wrongdoing will not be tolerated forever. But you see, the ungodly man has flattered himself. He has sought to turn off the voice of conscience so that he believes my iniquity will never be discovered. And so rather than having a kind of hatred or loathing for it, which is the response we are supposed to have, he actually begins to love it. And so then in verse 3, you can see he's reaching a point of almost complete wickedness. He says, <clears throat> the psalmist says, the words of his mouth are wickedness and deceit. He has ceased to be wise and to do good. Now, don't miss, please, uh, this important point at the end of verse 3. It says he has ceased to be wise and to do good. Now, if you are a careful reader of the Psalms, you know that in Psalm chapter 51, David, when he is caught in adultery with Bathsheba, he says, surely in sin my mother conceived me. Surely I was born in iniquity. In sin, my mother conceived me. Which invites the important question, when was that time when which, uh, in which David, or any of us, was not a sinner? When was that time when David was not a sinner, or any one of us? Because David is not speaking in Psalm 51 just about himself, but he's talking about the general lot of the whole human race, each one of us. If David was conceived at the very moment of conception, David was already a sinner. Then when was that time when we were without sin? We come into the world with a guilty record already. Uh, as much as it goes against human pride, it is nevertheless true because the scriptures tell us that we were born and conceived, even conceived at that moment of conception, in a state of original sin. So when was that time? Uh, well, in my prayer before this, I alluded to it. It was that time when we stood in the Garden of even Eden with our federal head, Adam, uh, and our first mother, Eve. And we decided, as we stood in Adam and Eve, to disregard God and to follow our own wicked ways. And so then all of Adam's posterity are implicated in his sin. Because Paul tells us in Romans 5 that in him we all sinned. Augustine says about this, if you don't like the concept of original sin, my advice to you, if you're offended by the doctrine of original sin, Augustine says, my advice to you is to stop sinning. Just quit. If you don't like it, if it's so offensive, then cease to do it. But he says also, not only can we not stop sinning until we are regenerated, but we can't even conceive the desire to stop sinning. And you see, the desire to do something has to come before the doing of it. So we don't even want to stop sinning until the Lord has regenerated us. And then when he has given us a new will, then by his grace we say, I no longer want to be a wicked person. And then God gives us the mercy to make progress in that, in this life, however small. And so don't miss in this verse the end of three, it says he has ceased to be wise, which assumes there was a time when even the ungodly man had a desire to be wise and to do good. In other words, this is an explanation of the concept of original sin, because we know that this ungodly man, like everyone since Adam and Eve, was conceived and born in unrighteousness with original sin. This is not an excuse. It is not an excuse. Nobody can say, why did God make me this way? Why is it that I am born with original sin? This is not an excuse, the scriptures tell us. It is not an excuse. He plans wickedness, verse 4, upon his bed. He sets himself on a path that is not good. He does not despise evil. Dear Christian, when you lay your head down at night on the pillow, uh, as I trust you do each day, and you get good sleep, what are the plans that cross through your head? What are the 
ideas and the, the pleasures and the joys and the passions and the interests that occupy and obsess your heart. It is a rare time in our busy lives, perhaps, when we lay our heads down at night. Uh, for a moment, we have ceased all the activity of the day. We have decided that whatever pressing business we may have, our work, our families, our churches, uh, the cares and concerns of the world, we have decided that for a moment at least, whatever those things are, we have to set them aside and sleep. Uh, this is how God has designed and made us that we need rest. And the Psalms tells us that he gives sleep to those he loves. It is a contrast here with the plotting and the planning of the wicked man. Even when he lays his head down upon his pillow at night, what is he meditating upon? More wickedness for the coming day. If by God's grace, when you lay your head down at night on the pillow and you are not consumed by wickedness, you're fighting it for sure, you're fighting it, but if you are not consumed by it and you are instead praying for the well-being of your family, you're praying for the well-being of your church, you're giving thanks for the blessings and the joys you have had for that day, you're asking strength for the challenges of the next day, then you can give God great gratitude that you are characterized that way and not like this wicked man who plans wickedness upon his bed. He sets himself on a path that is not good. Now throughout the Psalms, uh, specifically in Psalm 1, the Christian life as contrasted to the life of the wicked is described in terms of where we uh, stand, where we sit, and where we walk. You are familiar with that from Psalm 1, I trust. And blessed is the man who does not stand in the way of the wicked or sit in uh, the seat of the unrighteous or walk. Uh, in other words, <clears throat> the wicked man has set himself on a path that is not good. He has decided and chosen, you see. This is not what we would call original sin, but we would call actual sin. He has chosen. I am going to commit unrighteousness. This is my purpose. And I'm not even going to take time out at the end of the day to sleep. I'm going to meditate and toss and turn on how I can be wicked. He does not despise evil. And that is the end of the first section. It is a characterization, grim and frightening, of the wicked man who has sought to silence the voice of conscience to uh, wipe away from the tablet of his heart that engraving of God's law, the knowledge of good and evil that God himself put there. He has committed himself entirely to evil. Now you may be asking, if you're paying close attention, as I trust you are, how come there's no description in here of the righteous man? How come it moves directly from a description of the wicked and the ungodly to a description of God and his mercies and uh, love. The answer is because the first part of the psalm characterizes everyone. It characterizes everyone before they are in Christ. It characterizes you and me. As I am describing, based on this psalm, the life of the wicked man, I hope that none of you, none of us, are saying, that's how the ungodly are, those ungodly wicked persons. I certainly can't identify with or relate to that. That's what those persons are like, heavens no. The description in the first four verses is who we are, conceived and born in sin and very devoted to it until such time as God in his mercy has compassion on us and regenerates us. And why does he do this? Why does God decide to treat us with mercy and compassion and uh, teach us carefully the difference between right and wrong and not let it uh, depart from our hearts? Why is it that God mercifully says, I will make you my child and I will uh, cast away from you your sins as far as east is from west and your guilty heart, which is crimson and stained with all your foul deeds, I will make it as white as snow through the wonderful detergent of my son's blood. Why does he do that for some and not for others? Because he is a loving God who wants to do that. He treats you and me with compassion, not because we are better persons, but in order to make us better persons. Not because we are good, but in order to make us good. Because he will have mercy on whom he has mercy, and he will harden whom he hardens. 
And this is why, then, because we are to see ourselves in verses 1 through 4, I believe this is why he moves immediately, the psalmist does, into a description of God's great and loving character. Verse 5. Your loving kindness, O Lord, extends to the heavens. Your faithfulness reaches to the skies. Your righteousness is like the mountains of God. Your judgments are like a great deep, O Lord. You preserve man and beast. Do you see the sharp contrast? The sharp contrast here is between the, the plans and the wickedness of the ungodly man and the great loving kindness of the Lord. The psalmist here in these two verses, 5 and 6, he focuses on four different qualities or aspects of God's character. I don't believe this is meant to be an exhaustive list. It's not as though these are the only uh, qualities and attributes that our loving God has, but these are the four that the psalmist decides to focus on in sharp contrast to the character of the ungodly. Notice these with me. In verse 5, he says, first of all, loving kindness. Later in 5, he says, faithfulness. And then in 6, righteousness, and also in 6, judgments. And these are the four qualities or attributes of God, which are contrasted here by the psalmist with the life of the ungodly. And the first one is loving kindness. Loving kindness. And what does this mean? It means that God, from his free grace, decides to place his eternal love on uh, weak and sinful men and women, boys and girls, who have no claim nor right to that loving kindness. For he chose us in him before the foundations of the world to be holy and blameless in his sight. In love he predestined us to be adopted as his children. The psalmist looks around for some metaphor or comparison, some analogy. What is God's loving kindness like? And he says, it is of such infinite size that it extends to the heavens. It is of such infinite size that it extends to the heavens. Boys and girls, if you were to visit a really large city, I don't mean Sheboygan or Green Bay, uh, some place like Chicago, and you were to stand downtown, children, you were to look up at some of the enormous buildings that you can find there in Chicago. I think what used to be called the Sears Tower, but now it's the Willis Tower. Maybe it's changed names again. It is a massive building. It extends to an unbelievable height. Imagine how that building was built, and the men and perhaps women who had to walk around on steel girders with hard hats and so forth to build this impressive structure. The psalmist says that the loving kindness of the Lord is infinitely larger than that really tall building. It extends to the heavens. It keeps going and going and going. His faithfulness as well reaches to the skies. So what is beyond the heavens? Well, beyond the heavens are the skies, wherever that is. But it's incredibly large and goes on to such a height and a distance that even the most penetrating eye can't glimpse it. Right? We can look into the sky. We can gaze with telescopes into the galaxies and universe. There's no known limit at present to the size of the whole thing. The loving kindness and the faithfulness of the Lord is like this. They extend to the heavens and they reach to the skies. Notice the connection, please, between God's loving kindness and his faithfulness. What would it be like if God were loving to us for a moment? It would be a great and undeserved kindness if he were to be merciful to us for just a moment. But you notice that's not what he's like. His loving kindness is joined with his faithfulness. He has promised, dear Christian, never to leave you nor forsake you. There is nothing you can do if you are engraved, if your name is engraved on the palm of his hand. There is nothing that you can do to take yourself out of his faithful love. Paul tells us in Romans that there is nothing in all heaven and earth that can come between our loving God and ourselves. Height nor depth, angels or demons, past nor present, on and on he goes. Anything in all creation that can separate us from the love of God in Christ. His loving kindness is joined closely to his faithfulness, you see. And what is the basis of this? Well, in verse 6 he says, It is righteousness. It is righteousness which is like the mountains of God. 
God not only loves us with faithfulness, but he gives us his righteousness. You might say, I don't really see that in the text, that God gives us his righteousness. Well, remember uh, verses 1 through 4 and the description of the godless wicked man with all his evil plots. If anyone is going to be in the presence of a holy God and receive his favor, what does that person have to have? That person has to have righteousness, and where is it going to come from? It is belonging to God. Notice how each of these phrases begins with your, your loving kindness, your faithfulness, your righteousness, and finally, your judgments. The righteousness is like the mountains of God. They are firm and fixed. What is the largest uh, most permanent thing in our experience? What is the largest, most permanent kind of structure uh, or idea in our experience? It is the mountains. If you travel west from here on I-80 or something like that and you come down into uh, Colorado, you can see, I believe, at a great distance, the mountains which uh, look very small at a distance and then they loom ever larger on the horizon as you approach them. And when you are standing at their foot, you think, Oh my, that is uh, unbelievably large. Who could possibly have put this here and who could ever remove it? Now, human beings, we build houses on it and we tunnel underneath it and those kinds of things, but it's really uh, absolutely no effect. It has no effect on these mountains. They are massive and immovable. Uh, they fill our imagination and our view. And God's righteousness is just like that. It is overwhelming in its presence. And finally, his judgments are like a great deep. So we've had the sky, we've had the mountains, now we have the ocean. Your judgments are like a great deep. They are like the ocean. Uh, they are not able uh, to be penetrated. We cannot get to the bottom of God's judgments. They are mysterious. This is another way of saying that God's judgments are mysterious. And if we only had this, if we only knew that God's judgments were mysterious and beyond comprehension, we might be filled with panic and dread because we know what kind of people we are. But you notice that his judgments are carefully and closely connected with his righteousness, his faithfulness, and his loving kindness. I say it again, he will never leave nor forsake you. And this leads the psalmist to say at the end of six, O oh Lord, you preserve man and beast. You are the one who preserves us. And notice that God is so merciful that his kindness even extends to beasts. Uh, animals are mentioned frequently in the scriptures, often as a means of comparison. He made them at the beginning and put them in their various places. He owns the cattle on a thousand hills. Uh, the birds of the air even are precious to him. Not a single sparrow can fall to the ground without the will of our Father in heaven. As I was driving along this morning on my way to church, I glimpsed in the distance a little squirrel, and for a moment I had a sense of irritation. I hope that squirrel gets out of the way before I arrive at that point, because I really don't want to run over him. But I may have to if he gets in my way. Uh, think about what the scriptures say about the way that even the sparrows which God has made are important to him. He notices the death of every one of the things he has made, and you, dear Christian, are worth far more, far more to him than a sparrow. And Jesus says they're bought and sold for a few pennies, a sparrow. But you were made in his image, in knowledge, righteousness, and holiness, with dominion over the creatures, as the Catechism says. You are precious to him, and in Christ you are preserved and never lost. And this is why the psalmist says, How precious is your loving kindness, O God, and the children of men take refuge in the shadow of your wings. In Matthew 23, our Lord says, O Jerusalem, O Jerusalem, how I have longed to gather you under my wings like a hen does to her chicks. The wing in Scripture, the wing of the Lord, is meant to describe a position of great security and comfort, of warmth and protection from fear. Uh, maybe because we're not as familiar with chickens and animals as our ancestors uh, maybe it doesn't really mean as much to us in some ways, the analogy, but think of a child with uh, his mother, which is um, a metaphor from Psalm 131. Like a weaned child with its mother is my soul within me. So we are in the presence of God, you know, somewhere nestled near uh, uh, 
the mother's arms uh, near her chest, held in a place of warmth and comfort and safety and security. When a baby is fussing and ornery and a baby can't be calmed and stilled, they always say, give that baby to its mother. And the mother, through some kind of uh, almost unknown magic, uh, calms the child down so that it rests securely. This is what you and I are like in the presence of a loving God. We are held close to him like a chicken under the wing, a chick under the wing of his protection, or like a, a weaned child with its mother is my soul within me, says the psalmist. Not only that, but verse 8, they drink their fill of the abundance of your house. He shifts uh, metaphors or illustrations now from protection under the shadow of God's wing to the notion of drinking a fill in the abundance of God's house, and you give them to drink of the river of your delights. So not only are there many uh, animals and birds mentioned in the scripture, but there are a great number of rivers as well. We sung about one this morning, didn't we? From Psalm chapter 46, we saw there is a river whose streams make glad the city of God, the holy habitation of the Most High. And what does the river do? The river runs from a source which is sometimes unknown, but the river keeps running and it keeps moving on its way and it keeps bringing to us in a constant and steady and predictable fashion all of the good things that God has prepared for those who love him. So those who are within the loving kindness of God drink the fill of the abundance of his house, the river of your delights at all times. <clears throat> For with you, it says in verse 9, is the fountain of life. You see, the river has an origin in this fountain, which is described as the fountain of life, which is another way of saying that God himself is the source of all things. And for us, his children, he is the source of all good. And the final metaphor then he uses is, in your light, we see light. In your light, we see light. If God did not illuminate everything, if he didn't cause his light to shine in the whole world, if he did not illuminate our minds and our hearts, we would have no knowledge of him. We would be plunged into utter darkness. This verse, in some ways, uh, Calvin says, is the most emphatic one in the psalm. If you need some understanding of how dependent you are upon God, if you need some way to understand how dependent you are upon his knowledge and love, uh, this verse, perhaps, will teach you that. In your light, it will teach us that, we see light. We would not know what light is if God did not illuminate our minds. The Apostle John says in chapter 1 of his uh, gospel, he says, uh, the light has shined in the darkness, and the darkness has not comprehended it. And what does that mean? It means that God himself not only is the light, but until he illuminates us, we cannot see the light. We cannot see <laughs> the light of Christ. It ends then with this prayer in verses 10, 11, and 12. Oh, continue your loving kindness to those who know you. The psalmist has seen the picture of the wicked man. He understands that he is not too far from that. He has then seen the picture of God's uh, loving kindness, his faithfulness, his righteousness, and his deep, deep judgments. He has seen all of the blessings that come from a close and intimate connection with God his Father. It's like being uh, cradled under the wing of a mother bird. It's like drinking from a river of delights that never stops flowing, never ceases. It comes from a fountain of life and is filled with light. And so then he prays, oh, continue your loving kindness to those who know you. Please, Lord, always keep me by your side. Is this motivated by fear or is it motivated by love and trust? I would say this is motivated by love and trust. The psalmist knows that he has an eternal security with the person of his God. And so it's not that he prays because he thinks it's going to be taken away, but because his soul is so enraptured with God's mercy and love. His soul is so thrilled with the concept of God's goodness that he says, please, uh, Lord, cause this wonderful relationship to continue. And your righteousness to the upright in heart. He says in verse 11, Let not the foot of pride come upon me. Let not the hand of the wicked drive me away. This, once again, is an expression of utter dependence. I'm here in your presence, dear Lord, beneath your wing in the shelter of your protection. Please keep my enemies off of me. Don't let anyone step on me. 
in their pride, don't let any wicked person push me away from your presence. Who are our enemies, dear Christian? I mentioned them before. Our enemies are threefold, and so long as we are members of the militant church here below, before our names have been transferred to the roles of the church triumphant, we will be engaged in a constant and difficult and obnoxious warfare with these three enemies, the devil, the world, and our own flesh. And the scriptures describe the devil as a roaring lion who's prowling about looking to chew and gobble somebody up. Lord, protect us from him. And then there is the world as well, which is no friend to righteousness with its endless parade of foolish distractions and temptations and pleasures. Lord, let not the foot of pride come upon me or the hand of the wicked drive me away. And if by some grace we can for a moment escape the snares of the devil and the press of the world, we have another enemy even closer, do we not? We have an enemy that is so close that Paul will say in Romans 7, what I want to do, I can't. But what I don't want to do, these are the things I keep doing. That third enemy is our own flesh. That old man, that old nature that has to be mortified and crucified and put to death by the grace of Christ. As Paul says, I have been crucified with Christ and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. The life I live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me, which means that Christ died not just so that someone could possibly be saved, but Christ died to save Paul, and Christ died to save you and me. Let not the hand of the wicked drive me away. Lord, save me from all my enemies. And finally, in verse 12, it ends, as I said, on a sober note. And why is this? Well, because although... Uh, we will someday drink from that river of delights which flows from the fountain of life and we will be in the presence of the uh, eternal God. We will see him face to face in some sense, as Paul says in his letters. We will know him as he knows us in some mysterious way that exceeds comprehension. All of that is yet to come. It awaits us in the next life. And for this life, we have this sober warning to anyone that may be listening the doers of iniquity have fallen. They have been thrust down and cannot rise. You see, this is the destination. This is the end of the story for those who refuse to submit to God's righteous judgment and be cleansed by his son. How should we respond to that? Well, in two ways. We should remember, as Calvin says, that until we understand God's electing love, we will never root out pride from our hearts. So long as we do not understand, so long as we do not understand that we are saved, not because we are good people, but to make us good people, we will always have some uh, thread of pride to cling to, to say, I am in Christ because of something I have done. Until we have understood God's elective love, we will not understand. We must have no pride or how much God loves us. And so when we read this, our response should not be, of course, ah, those wicked people, how foolish are those wicked people. Our response should be, oh, thank you, Lord, that you have saved me from this through no deserving of my own. And secondly, we must pray with earnest zeal for those who are now characterized by this kind of behavior, whether they are our family, our friends, our neighbors, whether they are near to us or distant and far off parts of the world, we must pray, have mercy, Lord. Have mercy on those men and women, boys and girls, that they may not be doers of iniquity, that they may not be thrust down such that they cannot rise. God's judgment is for sure coming, but may he spare many and have mercy. And may we devote ourselves to prayers of that sort, that God would illuminate their minds with this light and bring them uh, into his presence and hold them in his embrace. So what has the Holy Spirit taught us? <clears throat> the Holy Spirit has taught us many things, I trust, about God's loving kindness and about what the wicked person is like. And what would the Holy Spirit have us do? Well, it's all been done for us, of course, but the Holy Spirit wants us to believe these things. And if you're having trouble believing them, if your faith is weak, as our faith often is, then you simply pray and say, I believe, Lord, help my unbelief. Please join me in prayer.
Gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you for the words of your Holy Scripture. We thank you for the beautiful lessons in this psalm. We humbly ask, Father, that you would cause these lessons not to simply go through our minds and make their way out over the next few days, but we pray and ask and plead that you would cause these lessons to be engraved upon our hearts, that they would find a welcome home there, and you would cause these lessons, Lord, to bear fruit in our lives. Uh, if not today or tomorrow, in your good time, that you would cause us to have a greater uh, love for you, a trust in your faithfulness and your deep judgments. You would cause us, Lord, to uh, hate sin and abhor it and uh, to flee from it as the description here of the godless and wicked man is so frightening. And that you would cause us, please, Lord, to pray for those who are outside your church that you would have compassion and mercy on them. We pray all these things uh, in confidence because you are a loving Father who loves to give good things to his children. And we pray them in the name of our Lord Christ Jesus. Amen. <clears throat>